Welcome, everybody, to episode eight of PT Shop Talk. I'm Casey Hansen. Across with, from me is the Simon to my Garfunkel, Nick Doling. Good morning, Casey. I only call myself doing? Garfunkel because of my curly hair. Um, like, zero, yeah, zero musical talent. I respect that you gave me Paul Simon. Yeah, it's he's better. I, I appreciate. <laughs> so you just call you just call me out. <laughs> yeah, that's such a hit. That's Chevy Chase's best work. That Ooh, music is, video. Are we jumping ahead? Are we going all the way to our top five? No, no, no. That's okay. a hit. There's, there's no. That is. I was gonna say is, we we established criteria, you know, which we'll <laughs> get to later. But I mean, that's not an underrated gem. That's that's just a that's gem. a that's just a rated gem. It's right where it should be. So it looks like we both survived Valentine's Day, even though I gave my wife a vacuum cleaner. What oh, uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what okay, what brand? Because <laughs> as we've gotten older, I kind of nerd over like vacuums and stuff. So what kind of brand? So I actually went with uh, a D-Bot robot vacuum. Oh yeah. Um yeah, mopping, vacuuming, uh, does it all. Here's I mops. Do. What's that? Yours mops? Apparently. <laughs> dang uh you know we used to we used to have one of these little guys roaming our house free range for years and when it quit working i guess you realized how much you missed having like somebody vacuum your floors every single night for two hours oh yeah we we, ours we had a d-bot i think my i think we got it as christmas gift from my mom like cheap like six seven years ago Mm mm-hmm and it's just the vacuum unit. I mean, we're not yeah. as you know techy as maybe you are with you know, mop and all that. But the thing has been like on the fritz all the time for oh, the last really? like five for five of the years. You know, it's like mm. it seems to run and you got battery issues, stuff like that. But back in the day when he was humming, it was kind of nice. Yeah. I think I mean Dbot's just a cheaper brand than Roomba, but boy, yeah. you know, it is like a two hundred dollar difference. So how do you not have Roomba money? I mean, I, you're like up in the Silicon Valley of North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just from the oil to my pocket, as they say up here. Yeah. You're fracking straight from Fargo. Yeah. Should be doing live reads for Roomba. Maybe they'd send me one. Hear that Roomba people? Yeah. Right. So are, are the Dolings big Valentine's people? You guys go on a wonderful date, candlelight? We, you cook? <laughs> no. No, we did <laughs> not. We had um both michelle and i worked all day uh, <laughs> romantic and i took uh yeah i took two of our boys to wrestling practice that night so there was not a whole lot of romance going on i i was proactive though knowing that would be the schedule so uh, i took my daughter with me and we selected some flowers a nice mm. bouquet of flowers and balloons and um, a few like pieces of jewelry for michelle um, gave that to her Saturday, you know, kind of proactively. You know, Surprise, Valentine's you know, Monday. Like that. Yeah, and with the Super Bowl kind of being on Sunday, we didn't want to take away from that either, right? <laughs> yeah, you'd hate to dig into that with the romance. It's weird when you got two two pseudo holidays so close to each other. <laughs> wow, pseudo holiday? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any um, you know, did you guys go on a date? No, we're also not. <laughs> We've been married for. Ugh, 11 years almost so yeah, nice. those those date nights have slowed down a little bit we always do the papa murphy's heart-shaped pizza with the kids Ooh. breadsticks dessert so that's good i'm getting too old though i, I hammered that pizza down because worked all day and didn't have time for lunch so i got home and hammered that down and man hey, heart happy burn. valentine's day to you yeah, yeah. It was the best yeah. Valentine's ever. But man, I woke up with heartburn at like three in the morning and I'm like, I gotta quit eating like this. Yeah, it's, it's it's conversations like that and the one that we had just prior to hitting record that make us feel like really old. Like you know <laughs> yeah. you're getting there. You know, colonoscopy time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's boy, you cannot avoid aging. It's interesting. Yeah. But I do like Valentine's because I'm a big Valentine's box guy. I like making them with my kids. Mm -hmm. um so we spent about two or three hours on saturday making them which when i say making them i mean me and my wife making them while our children help zero yeah i can see that at that point yeah yeah and they hit 
Yeah. Do they? But they do they try to help? I mean, do they try to like? Um, my daughter three tries to help. You know, she wants to use the glue. She mm-hmm. wants to stick stuff down. My son's more. He looks over. He like that looks good, Dad. Like moves on. You know, they tell us what they want. I mean, they're. I I would love this for a box, um, and then we have to figure it out. I like that part of it. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Google has yeah, been be, my friend. He'll be the one reaping the benefits, you know. Or he did, right? Did he come yeah, back they got, with just a fat stack of candy? <laughs> yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, Valentine's is different, though. They they are moving away from the boxes. That, that is becoming a thing of the past. Uh, at well, least see, in down, the down here, Fargo they, area. They, they, yeah, we we have we have it. I don't know. I was surprised this year that our kids were able to bring. Um, at least a couple of our kids were able to bring boxes this year. Yeah. create their thing but some some years we we have it they right. are, so I, daycare's I kind of put a size limit on it mm-hmm. shoe box is kind of what mm-hmm. they're looking for now yeah gotcha. uh, and then uh, my buddy's kids oh. in the school district here in west fargo and they just do valentine's bags that they decorate during the day mm-hmm. like brown paper bag uh, puts everybody on a level playing field do you do you happen to have this box that you can show me right now can i oh, see man. this box no uh, it's somewhere actually it's probably my son's room he's probably sleeping I'm so not prepared yeah no i uh <laughs> awkward i did a pikachu a uh, pikachu for my son it's pretty solid i'll have to mm-hmm. shoot you out a pic of it yeah and yeah, my son had a pokemon trainer but that was more like prefab came that way mm. so really easy minimum minimum work and it actually, yeah. since he had a birthday like two weeks ago, it worked out really well. I think Michelle had it up as a prop during the decorating phase of that. So <laughs> okay. and it, it doubled as his box and it's really nice that way. So is it like a pinata? Can you just smash the hell out of it now? No, it's not quite that big. Oh, that would have been sweet. It's like <laughs> um, dimension wise, probably eight inches by like eight inches. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's not a bad size. It's bigger than a shoe It's box. fit enough candy. I mean, he brought back some good candy, but you know, not that that's a problem. We we on that whether it's like Halloween or Valentine's or any of the you know parades that we take our kids to or anything like that. It's like they come back with tons and tons of candy, and then we put it up in our pantry, and it just sits. Like they'll they'll get after it right away, and it just sits there, it sits there, and then seven eight months later, we finally dump it. It's full of rock hard fruities or you know. Just kind of grossed out <laughs> and stuff. I don't know. Fruities are good anytime. Yeah. Well, what'd you now? I mentioned the Super Bowl. What would you think of the game? It was good. It was good. I've uh, I've always been a defensive guy when it comes to football. Uh, I like defensive battles. So, which surprisingly, I came into that game assuming it was going to be just this shootout, but instead it was kind of played between the 20s, uh, one of those kind of games. We all did, right? Uh, that was our and, and we were all and we were all um we wouldn't have made any money no no yeah i thought the, yeah thought the rams were gonna easily put up high 20s and, and i think if odell beckham doesn't go down i do think the rams um, you're drinking that chris collinsworth kool-aid pull away in that game a little bit i will never drink the chris collinsworth kool-aid but it did seem like the Bengals were having a hard time covering him um probably a byproduct of how hard they were trying to cover cooper cup that whole game yeah yeah you're right i mean there's a lot of dynamics that, that come with it, losing a guy like that and when it happened it was like oh man you know you kind of we were, we were playfully michelle and i were playfully like pulling for the Bengals and the kids hmm. were pulling for the rams and we had these little side bets but you hate to see something like that. Like once he went down non-contact, you're like, that's not good. Mm-hmm. No, that is his history. <laughs> rarely a good deal to go non-contact. I, I thought Joe Burrow was done for too when he got rolled up on. Oh my gosh, that looked really bad. Yeah, and he was in pain. And when he was walking off the field, it didn't look that stable. <laughs> you uh-huh. know, it it yeah. reminded me a lot of when um Carson Wentz got hurt and he walked off the field it wasn't quite that dramatic where he stepped on his leg and it like bowed like five well, inches you're talking about the Eagles game right yeah. where, where he, where he, where he used, I should say Eagles game but yeah but he did that didn't he do that going for like running in a touchdown or going yeah. for two yeah. yeah I remember that yeah. yeah he ran in the touchdown he came back out with the torn ACL and they went for two 
Mm -hmm. um, but Burrow looked, uh, it was very similar how he was walking on it. And I was like, ugh, and it just didn't look good. But when, yeah. it was one of those things that like, <clears throat> like when it happened live, like, oh, Odell's when it happened live, you're like, hey, you know, uh, and it did, I mean, it, it, it's not as nasty, but yet, you know, mm -hmm. on contact wise, it's just not good. And with Burrow's when it happens live, you're just like, all right, another sack or whatever it was, yeah. right? I think it was a sack. And then um, the replay shows that other angle in slow mo and how his knee got folded up. And, and he like, instantly <laughs> grabs his knee and they like zoom in on his face and he's yeah, know, screaming. Right? You're like, oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that's literally like in there. And I mean, what a badass though to be able to, if it's true what they said, like he gets to the sideline and backup guys warming up and he's like, no, forget about it. I'm, I'm going back in, you know? Yeah, and, uh, just got swagger. And, uh, you know, Stafford was kind of the same thing. He got rolled up pretty hard on his ankle there. And yeah. There was no yeah. way Stafford wasn't finishing that game if he could walk. I mean, that dude mm -hmm. would go out for the Lions when he was half dead and finish a game. So, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I don't know. doubt his toughness at all. Yeah. It, you know, I'm like with a lot of other people, I thought, it, you know, the whole game had such a nice flow to it with, you know, the lack of penalties. Mm -hmm. And then how weird it was, you know, that sequence where there's like three in a row and a couple of them, you're even kind of like, you know, it, it was just, it just didn't fit the consistency of the game, I guess. Yeah. Maybe I don't want to be, fishing, but, be yeah. that conspiracy theorist, but it felt like somebody up top pressed the button and was like, let the Rams win, let them win. Yeah. Right? Yeah, kind like, of, or, yeah. Or just pay, pay super close attention to, you know, every one of these guys and, Especially that Wilson, that, that linebacker Wilson, he got called for holding and and they showed the opposite side. His hand never actually like grabbed anything. Mm -mm. Yeah, it and, was like just a beautiful football play from a linebacker. Where you're mm -hmm. like, man, you can't expect a linebacker to cover better than that. And the dude gets right? penalized. And I yeah. think it was that same play where the Rams jumped off sides, like three of their linemen jump off sides and they don't throw a flag. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty blatant. And yeah, and then you had that that weird um it was like offensive holding but at the same time cup got just drilled yeah helmet to helmet you know helmet yeah. to helmet and um yeah, just a, you know just a weird kind tough. of a weird, weird end of the game you know yeah it's tough when like a nasty play like a personal foul helmet to helmet gets like wiped off the board from a holding you know they're like ah, i guess yeah. it's the same penalty <laughs> yeah Ooh, man i could have put hey, cup out of the game i mean how you know i know and you can't go back and like re-vote like the NFL can't go back and re-vote on like defense player of the year offense player of the year just because of the Super Bowl but obviously Aaron Donald's in that conversation you know he, he's won it three times and this mm -hmm. year I mean when you watch that game and, and I mean TJ Watt's pretty impressive too with you know as many sacks as he had but anytime you, you get to watch Aaron Donald you, I don't know how you can come away not thinking this dude is the most impressive guy on the field either side of the ball yeah, I, you know. uh, I agree. He's probably one of the best, most dominant football players uh, any position. Maybe ever. Maybe <laughs> yeah. ever. Um, I mean, and I've definitely said it before. He's probably, in my mind, the largest gap in skill at a position that I ever remember. Uh, between like, him and, like, the number two yeah, guy? Yeah, right. Okay, like, yeah. I mean, for most positions in the NFL, you can – I don't know. I would say you could argue back and forth, maybe three or four guys, typically, you know, quarterback, you can go through that conversation. Oh receiver. yeah. It's, it's kind of like just who you like better. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, or, yeah. But you, you know, there's right. probably, there's probably a few years maybe where Gronkowski was uh, leaps and bounds ahead of the next tight end. And I mean, Kittle that what two or three years ago was, you know, yeah. a tight end leaps and bounds ahead just because he could but do everything. Say, Look at how long I don't know if you could say Kittle because look, I mean Kelsey's been year. in that mix, yeah. you know, really forever. Um, I think where Kittle maybe maybe Kittle has better blocking and just more mm. consistent there. But um, as far as that other stuff, you know, Kelsey's right up there. I, but you're right. I mean, who is who's that next D tackle in the NFL? Yeah, it's like I mean, there's and nobody there's at some D nice tackle, players. Nobody at D tackles is versatile. I mean. Donald is, I mean, just a beast at pass rush at D tackle, which is rare. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's also phenomenal at run stopping. I mean, there was a few plays there where, I mean, he just reached behind the defender, grabbed the running back, pulled him down with one arm. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, he's the, he is the absolute complete package. And when you look at, you don't see any other, like you said, there's not another D tackle 
even close to him as far as performance wise, but you look at the way he looks and no other D tackle looks like him. No, you know, he's he, undersized for the position, but yet like just pure muscle mm-hmm. and he can overpower. Like there was a handful of plays, especially in that second half, you know, where he really came alive and those guards are, they're probably out weighing him by 45, 50 pounds, like every one of them. And yet he still just like, just keeps his feet moving, Mm. drives him wherever he wants to go and then gets rid of him to make a play or or force a play. Just insanely impressive. And then, so I thought getting maybe where I was starting with this, you know, kind of poetic that the final play really comes down to him getting his hands on Burroughs and forcing that like, you know, just desperation here. Yeah, he's even when he's double teamed, he's still pushing two guys. You know, I mean, it's, like it's unreal. Yeah, he's I, he's I, awesome to watch. Hey, I hope he doesn't retire. I, you know, there's some talk about him retiring early now that he's, you know, well, he's cemented himself. He's a Hall of Fame player if he quits today. Yeah, I mean, I mean he really. I, I mean, the the sacks, like I said, it gives you that glamour and and what he didn't break the record, did he? Was he like half or half a sack shy of straight hands? For some reason, I thought he broke Did the he? record because of the extra game, but uh, I could be wrong. I, thought, I, th- I know he had the Pittsburgh team record, but yeah, maybe he broke the. It'd be some to look at, but you know what? Let me do some research. I'll produce this thing. But for everything else that Donald does and elevates the play of everybody else around him, I mean, he he's the defense player of the year, Cooper Cup offensive player of the year, and so going to the other side of the football, I don't. I was talking with a, a couple of patients about this on Monday. I can't remember any receiver, including Jerry Rice, yeah, you know, Randy Moss in their prime, who the way he did this this season, like every single game, he put up numbers. Mm-hmm. Whereas those other guys, even Megatron's like phenomenal season in 2012. I mean, I, I can remember, I think he had like well over 200 against the Vikings in one game, but they were playing from behind the whole time. And and then he'd turn around like the next week and put up like 30, mm-hmm. you know, and be, be somewhat shut out, but then rebound. But Cup every single week either either broke 100 yards or had a couple touchdowns. And it's just so remarkable to see that happen. No matter what you try to do, how you layer coverage, anything like that, it didn't matter. And then here's the Super Bowl. He still gets two touchdowns in the Super Bowl, um, even with Odell Beckham being gone for about, mm-hmm. you know, two and a half quarters a game. Yeah, that last drive, you sit back and you go, I don't know why the Rams just didn't go, hey, we have four downs. We're going to pass it to Cooper Cup on three of those four, and he's going to catch two of those three every time. We'll just march down the field. I, yeah. his, his route running is uh, Jerry Rice-esque. I mean, yeah, that dude finds an opening, and then his hands are just great. I mean, nothing gets in his radius that he doesn't catch. It was He's impressive. You know, I watched him in college quite a bit just because yep. Eastern Washington was E-dub. pretty dominant at those times. Yep. Um, so it was fun to watch him because he was just cruising for all those FCS records. So you'd usually kind of follow that because I forget who SDSU had a really good receiver at the time too. And those two were kind of battling a little bit. Yeah, um, that's right. Um, and, the, and they had, yeah, leading right into Goddard too shortly mm-hmm. thereafter. Yeah, that's right. So, but Cooper Cup was... He was just, he was a different breed. Uh, you know, NDSU had the fortune to play Eastern Washington Cup senior year in Fargo and Cup gets hurt in the first half. So he didn't kind of a bummer. He'd good because NDSU barely won that game with Cooper Cup. I think they lose that game. So, yeah. I, you know, there's been some pretty good talent through the Fargo Dome uh, in my watching career, but I wish I could have saw him for a full game because I think if it would have came down to the last drive, I would have loved to see Cooper Cup just mm-hmm. try to do his thing, but yeah. And does he have? <laughs> I mean, we we're joking about this too, but I got to think he's got the most distinctive gait pattern of anybody in the NFL. He's just like head down, like, shoulder, didn't head get down shoulders higher. down, high <laughs> knees. He looks so awkward once he gets that ball in his hands, but yet you know, incredibly effective. Yeah, I mean that's maybe creates an illusion. That's why he gets open so much. Defenders are like ah, this a little hunchback guy. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and probably the last person you got to give props to slash I question it in that game is and the Bengals kicker. He is one yeah. of my favorite players. He doesn't even go into the locker room at halftime. 
sat and <laughs> watched the halftime show. He's like, watch the show. dude, it's Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. I know you guys are probably going to talk about the game and stuff, but I'm out here. <laughs> yeah, I know my I know my job, coach. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, when you tell me to go in, I'll kick it through the uprights. You know, that dude's just ooze swagger the whole postseason. And I don't know. He's, he's the first just... guy sending out memes about 50 cent being fat, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's on the bench, right, with his cell phone. <laughs> This is, you know, the whole bench is empty. He's got his arms up on the bench, just watching the halftime shows, smiling. What a just dude that's just <clears throat> taking in the whole thing. He knows his role on the team. But it's yeah. interesting to me that the coaching staff isn't like, ah, you know, maybe yeah. come with the rest of the team. <laughs> but yeah, right. Like there's not even like they didn't get in the locker room. The special teams coach isn't like, hey, where's where's McPherson at? You know? Yeah, like what's one of the most important parts of these special team meetings. Uh, but when, when Cup caught that touchdown pass with like 90 seconds to go, I would have bet any money that the Bengals went down and he and McPherson kicks the goal, put it over time. I mean, that's really what I was feeling. And mm-hmm. it looked like they were going to do that, you know, at the minimum. And then, um, you know, just some really weird play. I shouldn't say super weird play calling, but not, not the script that you, you necessarily want to go with, like what was working. Mm-hmm. for them you know they they you know complete a quick pat when they finally got to the 50 it's like first and 10 and then you know they get nine on the first play you're like all right and then the next play they go deep incomplete next play they, they, like instead of just running with Nixon like power set they go you know get a little too clever go shotgun spread everybody out and then again mix it and then he doesn't get anything all of a sudden you're stuck with fourth down and then Donald you know forces it so yeah, does his deal yeah it was a anticlimactic a little anticlimactic yeah yeah but, but that's why you play the games i mean like i said if i would be honest the rams probably a better team i'm yeah, yeah i yeah. thought they were gonna dominate and they didn't so it was a good game and um with young kids i can't say i watched a lot of the commercials so i don't have a lot of input on the commercials seem again nostalgia stuff right the dr evil the cable guy yeah you know, some of that yeah, stuff they did always, mind some of that stuff <laughs> that stuff always comes through uh there wasn't anything that stood out my larry david's always sweet I'm a big that was a David that was dad. a fun commercial yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he just is He's a character of himself and he knows it and he loves it. So I don't know. So did you, did you leave the Super Bowl and go right to the nearest, uh, you know, I guess vehicle lot and buy an electric car two or electric uh, truck? Two, two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Saving Just the world. Consciously. Like, I feel like I need to do this now. <laughs> yeah. Honey, I'll be back. Yeah. They had a, it was like a, I didn't catch them all, but from what I, what I really paid attention to, there was like a blend. Like you said, there were some fun ones, some funny ones. And then there was like the, the ones where you feel like shame, you know, <laughs> like, like, or like they just go, they're trying to hammer emotions and stuff. Like when, when Google was selling like their pixel phone camera as like being not racist where other <laughs> cameras previously somehow were racist. It's, yeah, right. it's like, you kind of lose me there. It's so over the top. It's so heavy handed. It's just like, ah, you know, yeah. And then you, then you, into it. Yeah. But good, good game. I mean, They've been there for the most part. I think the Super Bowls have been pretty good to watch the last, you know, however many years 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, been a while since there's been a super boring blowout Super Bowl. So, yeah, which we kind of grew up with. I mean, for <laughs> yeah, they were often one sided. Remember how the NFC won like 14 in a row <laughs> and most of them weren't even close? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's nice that they're close now because, like you said, when we were kids, it was like a foregone conclusion when you got to the Super Bowl who was going to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the the one that finally turned the tide, even the, that, that year the Broncos beat the Packers the first time. Yeah, I was going to say, that was kind of a tide turner there. Yeah, if Pack, I believe, were like 14-point favorites, you know, and, and they were just continuing this NFC dominance and, and Denver really swung everything. And then it was pretty balanced out for quite a while been that mm-hmm. way since yeah. which yeah. is a good thing yep good to have parody what did you think about the halftime show uh, how do you how do you grade mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. are you are you a big rap guy i can't say i'm a big rap guy okay. but that if if the little rap guy in me <laughs> out of that it's it's that demographic i mean it's that wheelhouse yeah i was talking to somebody like the first chronic album is like i'll take that over anything i, I know 
he didn't play anything off that. But that's really what put Dre and Soup on the map. Um, yeah, ain't nothing you know, but a G thing, man. I watched okay, that video I, a thousand times. I'm all about the performers. I absolutely loved the the theory behind it. You know, you're in LA. I guess this is the first time they were in the, the Super Bowl in LA in like 30 years too, which I wasn't aware of. Um, I know they've been in California since then, but. I suppose not having football teams in LA for a long time hurt that. Yeah. Um, but it should always be on a neutral field. So I, now I'm around reading, you know, two two years in a row, the home team gets to win the Super Bowl. So now that now somebody wants to have it on, like, essentially it will always be a neutral field. But it's like anything. It's like we talked about the overtime rules a few weeks back. It's, somebody's always going to leave unhappy. Um, I thought it was genius to, you know, book some Cal, like these guys that really, um, I guess they emulate California or maybe encapsulate that. Um, that's who you think of with West Coast mm-hmm. rap. Um, so that part was good. It's like the same crap that I'm not a big fan of with every every single halftime show. <clears throat> like, like, why does Eminem need a bunch of dancers to like flood the field? Like at the end of his set, they're all dressed like his character from Eight Mile. I don't know if you caught that. They're wearing like the sweatpants, the sweatshirt, and the hoodies over their head and. It's just, and then like when Kendrick Lamar is doing his part, there's all these guys who are like angrily dancing, you know, around. And it's, it's like, I don't know that I don't, that's just not my taste. Like, yeah. Like just leave them with a the mic, let them do their job. And the crowd was so into it. He didn't need all this other Gaga around it that like the pageantry, you know, to support it. I thought that was my, that was my one knock on it. And, and the fact that no matter who it is anymore, no matter what genre they're going to lip sync. And it just, mm-hmm. it, it takes away from that, you know, that live feel. Yeah, I kind of liked that. I felt like it wasn't as choreography as a lot of halftime shows were. I mean, you still had the folks, but like, it wasn't like, hey, look what we can do with 500 people on the field. You know, yeah. I, I felt like it didn't focus on that as much as some of the recent ones, you know, mm-hmm. you get the, yeah, the weekend yeah. out there with a million dancers well, the weekend last year dude Katie that was Perry so, with the show yeah <laughs> well i hope they don't go as deep as Katy perry with like dancers and everything mm-hmm. like that but, but i don't think they're necessary at all and that going back to the 50 cent part which is kind of funny that was in a way it's like a throwback because all of his dancers it felt like you're watching like a video a music video from you know 20 years ago oh, yeah. <laughs> the way that kind of had that vibe um which i get you know again that's i guess that's okay but it's just not my taste. Hmm. That's fair. Yeah, I, I didn't mind it. I, I thought it was good. It uh, made me feel a little old, though, again, because I remember like 10 years ago when the Super Bowl was probably 12 years ago, had the who. And I was like, yeah, ah, what are we doing with the who here? Nobody cares. Oh, this is yeah. for like grandpas. Well, and now here we are 12 years later and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like they're finally speaking to my generation and all the young people are like, I don't know what's that dude that hangs out with Martha Stewart doing rapping like yeah like, and oh, Dre, yeah, I mean, now I'm old like I gotta Dre, say Dre, Dre looks, looked Dre looks old. he looked but he looks good because when you figure well, he's probably yes. pushing 60 yeah he just had a stroke not too long ago you know I mean but yeah. it, it did make me feel a little old I thought Mary J looked good for her age though I mean she was definitely yeah. flaunting it <laughs> you know yeah, um, <laughs> even that I'm like, God, it, it reminded me of was it a couple of years ago where Shakira and Jennifer Lopez did it, and they were mm-hmm. like turning fifty or J Lo was fifty or anyways, and people were like, Ooh, you really need to always do that. But you know, um, I'm not approved by any means either. No. I just don't. I don't. I don't remember Mary J Blige ever dressing like that when she was in her prime. <laughs> oh, know, she I think, was always kind of a. Uh she was always respected for like her voice and her, yeah. her, you know, her talent more than like that part of the genre where you're, you know, at the time you're compared to, you know, Britney Spears, um, even Beyonce coming out of that destiny's child cut mm-hmm. was like, well, let's show as much skate as we can and shake as much as we can. And Mary J was a little bit more like the traditionalist, I guess. A little um, classier. Yeah. Maybe. A RB. Yeah. But <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I mean, again, I'm, I have, I bet you I had, uh, well, I know that I had the Chronic, Chronic 2001, uh, Doggy Style. I mean, everybody had to have Doggy Style. Yeah, that's um, just sweet. I probably had the first two 50 Cent albums, the first like two or three Eminem ones. 
So, I mean, it, it definitely, from a genre standpoint, I'm, I'm digging it, but um, the delivery just wasn't there for me. I'll allow it. Well, it's time to move on to our main topic. We're continuing our talk on chronic low back pain. Uh, this Good, is a, my back is killing me from carrying you this morning. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. <laughs> I just, want, I just wanted to work that in. So. Yeah, I don't like it, but we will edit that out in post. Um, yeah. yeah, so apparently this is a, what, like part four of a 30-part series we're doing on chronic yes. back pain. Um, we're moving a little slow through it, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're kind of moving on to that. What is our history intake? What does our initial exam look like? You know, and I think when we talk about chronic back pain, it's how do you fit in everything? You know, the back is such a middle region of your body. You know, how do you look at thoracic spine? How much mm -hmm. do you play into what is the upper body doing during activity? I mean, I, I think we all go to the hip. I, I think you it's, yep. it's wise to clear the hip. Um, probably even wise to uh, you know we do that functional assessment what does it look like when you bend down to the floor what does it look like when you're twisting um so we're looking at knee we're looking at ankle uh but the question is how far down the rabbit hole do you go when you look at some of that stuff yep. um you know and then how do we suss out the psychosocial part of it too when we're doing subjective and um, even as we're going through and talking about how the functional stuff feels, how it looks, how it compares to their day-to-day -day life when they're doing it too. So um, I don't know, what's your philosophy on regional interdependence and the rabbit hole and do you use a Sourman algorithm from top to bottom? No, no. I might mention a few weeks back, I, I was doing an SFMA one for a while um it just got it, it becomes kind of tedious it's no it's certainly no knock on them and i like a lot of the logic behind it um it's just after a while you're like man this does this does take a while to tease out and it goes back to what we've been maybe one of the classic things that we talked about it, it, it's really patient dependent like you gotta you gotta read your patient you gotta be able to um, understand kind of their level of symptomology too right you know and, and how even if it's chronic pain, like what is their perception at that moment of how, how severe it is? And I can't just, you know, ignore that and, and, you know, blast forward, head down into all these functional assessments right away, right? Um, you have to, or else in my opinion, you're probably not going to have the patient come back mm -hmm. or you haven't really built a lot of trust with them. So I do, the two areas that I almost almost unequivocally always look at it would be the thoracic spine and then the hips like you said mm -hmm. um the things above and below right away i don't know how you know i know the classic people always talk two joints up two you know two joints above two joints below but um for the lumbar definitely looking at those two areas at a minimum and then getting on to whatever we need to do um if you if you do your job well enough the first time they're going to come back you know feeling better or at least have some appreciation and respect for, for your skill set. And then you can start teasing more stuff out. And that's the fun part about our job. When you, you don't have to be perfect the first time, mm -hmm. but they can come as they come back, then you start peeling back the layers, you start digging in more um, as you ask them to do more and, and things get revealed that way. So yeah, definitely looking at thoracic spine, what type of mobility they have there. Um, you know, are they just force loading and same thing with the hips, right? And I, I do believe the hips play a huge role in this, whether you know, from, from just a, we'll just say floor waist lifting standpoint, anything, any functional task you're doing under load, um, you know, are they too stiff? Are you not utilizing the glutes correctly so that you're overloading your spine, the lumbar spine? How about you? You're, you're looking at me like, uh, no, I, I think there's value in it, you know, and I don't, um, want to argue the fact that it's all patient specific, but I also don't want to make this such a broad thing that there's, you know, we don't want to necessarily do that with everybody. Just it's not great podcast material, but, um, you know, I typically, <laughs> just being honest, yeah. I mean, no, whether I it's good for the, I mean, I, um, <laughs> you know, I don't but think yeah, you, you can apply it, right. We, you can't apply the same thing to every single patient though. Yeah, we use the SINs model a lot when we when we teach, yeah. you know, severity, irritability, nature, state, stability. So yeah, if they're highly irritable, um, high severity, 
you know, that eval, that initial eval is definitely like psychosocial all the way. I, I mean, there's, there's evals where I may not really have the patient do a whole lot other than, you know, can you show me what comfortable movement looks like for you? <laughs> you know, and then that's maybe our session. Um, as far as, but if the irritability isn't too high and the severity is high, I still try to go, you know, what are your biggest issues, right? Well, she's getting out of a chair. Okay, let's look at it. Um, I, I don't necessarily go through a full, um, all right, touch toes, bend up, look to the ceiling, rotate, rotate, um, over pressure, um, hip, same thing, run people through that. I don't always do that because like you said, we can always come back and check that later. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think some, I think some therapists get very caught up in the like flow sheet of like, I have to hit all my points, you know, yeah. um, and, and I've moved away from that quite a bit. Now you will get that feeling patient specific that some patients will feel like you didn't do anything with them if you don't. Um, so mm -hmm. then, you know, I, I go through that's, that. That's my other concern with going purely Pretty psychosocial, gym. right? Like I've seen that when, when that really, when, we in Big Stone first brought in Adrian Lowe, 2016. Mm -hmm. Were you were you guys with us in the beginning of 2016? Yeah, I went to Adrian Lowe out in Marshall. Um, you were down here. Yeah, you even came and talked to me. You said, "Hey, yeah, I heard you." Of course, I did. You're the new guy in the company. I just wanted to that introduce was, myself. That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah. no, no, so I think when, when that and that was awesome, right? I <clears throat> I went predominantly because I was vaguely familiar with him. But just the fact, like you always say, God, our, our company's grown. It's just, you take advantage when you get to host something. You don't yeah, have right. to travel like three or four hours. Um, I, I was super impressed, right? The material, you know, going into it um, with uh, his delivery methods, a super engaging guy. Mm. I mean, you can't, you can't take any of that away. Charismatic as um, all get out. Totally, right? And um, especially with a topic that does not lend itself to charisma very well. Um, so uh, total hats off to him. Uh, a lot of brilliant research there too. Really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. But so we had a large contingent of staff, obviously attend, right? Because we're local and coming back and just seeing it. Maybe, and that's just the nature, I think, of therapists. Maybe it's healthcare providers in general. I can't speak for other, other practitioners, but, um, you know, the, the pendulum kind of swings to that, you know, gravitates towards that. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm just going to do this all the time. And you could just see patients like, you know, not coming back because we're like, wow, you know, how much did we really do with them or how much did mm -hmm. we engage them? Um, Cause we're not going to invest in a bunch of couches and just have everybody lay down and, and psychoanalyze the whole time either. You know, that's not really what we're called to do. And mm -hmm. so I've landed a more of a blended model to it where I, I totally respect and appreciate that is that exists and we need to cover it, but it's how we do it, how we deliver that piece. That's to me, the most important part is make or break with the patient. Yeah, it comes down to how I feel the patient's going to, if it's, if I feel like a, a full eval is just really going to dump this patient into misery, I find most of them are pretty happy with the psychosocial talk. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if somebody comes in and they go, yeah, it's, you know, it's been six out of 10 pain for 20 years and it'll get up to seven or an eight um, sore for a few hours, but I know how to deal with it. Those folks do pretty well. Like, let's just go through, show me everything, show me what hurts, um, mm -hmm. you know, do a few assessment things there. Uh, I, I like to see how the nervous system's working. I like, you know, nerve dynamics just to see how sensitive it is. I, I'm not yeah. a big believer in necessarily that like neurodynamics give you a lot of information about structure, right. um, I, but I, 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 I think they give you information about sensitivity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially for more, more acute, more acute, subacute stuff. I agree with you there. Like that's where I'll, I'll really look at more of the neurodynamics. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think, and where I'm going with this, well, you got me thinking neurodynamics. Now. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say something yeah. just before I that. There's value of them even in chronic patients, but. Yeah. Yeah. It's just how much you do that first day. And um, mm -hmm. I, what I was going to say, you know, my philosophy is like, and why I'm not afraid to do some of that, like the movement testing. And, and like, I, I like that you said, Hey, does it, does it bother you to do a sit to stand, right? Mm. Um, let's look at that. Because I think it, it's important at some level, not only to like, number one, look at the, maybe the basic body mechanics, but at a deeper level, um, 
to get them to understand too that movement does not always equal pain, mm-hmm. right? And and I'm I like to think of myself as a safe practitioner, and and I'm not going to ask you to do something that's going to damage you. It's going to repeatedly injure you. So you know, please please trust me with this, and I'm just doing it to assess. And and there's things I'm going to ask you to do. They might be uncomfortable at the time, but they're not damaging anything. Yeah, I from uh you know, I I swing away from the biomechanics. I'm probably too maybe too far away from not caring about the biomechanics that much but i think there's value in like show me what you know what really bothers you because i think it validates the patient and they know you're listening too because typically it's like oh man i can't pick something off the floor and then they go to the doctor and the doctor like touches their back and you know bend twist for me like they never actually have the patient show them yeah. their issue so I, I think that's right out the gate. It lets the patient know I've been listening to them. You know, you said that getting out of bed is what really bothers you. Let's just see it. You know, let's yeah, start with yeah. that. Um, the accessory stuff. I did isn't, that. As I think important. I did that one day. Yep, I agree with you. So just you can see day. a lot of those patients when you just go into the like, man, show me what it feels like. Point to where it hurts. You know, uh, I think it validates them too and gives them gives them therapeutic alliance with you right off the bat you know the rest of the stuff isn't because the patient doesn't really care that you're doing cpas and upas i mean there's some value in that stuff don't get me wrong because again i like to see sensitivity and um, tolerance to those things you know light touch deep pressure gives me an idea of what we can and can't do but um, that doesn't have a lot of value to the patient per se unless you sell it that way which i think is dangerous you know if you're doing a cpa and it's like oh you know it's really hyper mobile or hypo mobile or yeah boy it sure doesn't move here you know i think that's dangerous to do with your patients in some ways not not to do it but how you describe what you're doing you know no you're not going to find a lot of just now what i want to say though this is again this is my professional opinion right i don't want (laughs) to should we put as asterisks you know well, I, because I think if there are any other therapists out there who feel like, man, you know, that's the way we are. We get territorial or, mm. you know, defensive. Oh, yeah. but, but to that point, um, I have not done, I have not done a UPA or a direct, you know, central PA probably to the lumbar spine in at least six or seven years. So, I mean, I do agree with you there. I, I don't, I, I feel like the biomechanical issues that that can potentially be going on are more global in nature, mm. more functional in nature, and just attack it that way rather than you know the heavy dose of manual and directed right at the spot. Because they're and and to me that goes and whether you're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kick some little dirty dirt on like PRI where you're on a table for like you know 45 minutes doing an exercise. At some point, you got to get that patient off the table, mm. and they're gonna their feet are gonna be on the ground and they're gonna be moving around. So that's where the rubber meets the road. Just in my opinion, like you got to, you have to be able to meld those things and have it not be like, I have this magic wand and it's going to work for this brief moment of time and, and voila, right. Mm -hmm. Especially with chronic pain. Yeah. I feel like the patients I have had that I've been less successful with are because of those reasons. I'm way too heavy on manual, you know, patients, the research will say they don't get addicted to it or they don't depend on it, but I, I think that's flawed research <laughs> based now, on what my you, experience. But now, what if you do like if I if I have somebody I'm looking down here and we got symptom management methods, right? Mm. So if I'm using it to build that quote unquote therapeutic alliance, which we like to use, I have no problem doing even a little bit of like maybe it's just five minutes of like petrosage to somebody's erect, mm. right? Um, and as I'm doing that, that's your opportunity to either build rapport or, you know, to incorporate some PNE at that moment while I'm doing that, you know, because they're in a comfortable position. They're probably, they're probably open and receptive to a little more of what you have to say. Right. So I think that's, that's somewhere I can see some value in, in some manual therapy. That and some decompressive techniques like directed through, like doing some simple long access um, through the hips seems to make every, everybody seems to respond very well to that, um, mm-hmm. no matter like what, whether it's a hip pathology, spine pathology. And if that's getting them for that period of time to feel a little bit better, and then we're going to get up and move and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, kind of like bridge everything into function. I'm all for it. 
Yeah, I think it's how you preface it to your patients. You know, I, I'm not against CPAs, UPAs. I use them quite a bit because I, I think there's some, you know, it's the five minutes, right? It's, it's mindfulness a little bit for me, you know, like this is your low back. This is what your low back feels like. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily avoid your low back, right? Because mm -hmm. when it hurts so long, patients tend to want to dissociate from it. Um, so there's some mindfulness there. But yeah, if I preface it as like, you know, we're just desensitizing a little bit. So when we get out in the gym, we move, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with what we're doing. You know, it's, I'm not going to say it's a reward for going out in the gym and working, but in some ways it's, you know, um, this is going to allow us to move. Everything we yeah. do is designed to get you moving comfortably. You know, yeah. it's, if it reduces their guarding, reduces yeah. their tone, let's, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Which I think is, you know, for me, that's the issue is that the, the pain and the ache and stuff is just causing a lot of guarding and fear of movement and whether you want to say muscle inhibition uh you and i could maybe go back and forth on glute inhibition and uh what's causing that and where that comes from and how mm -hmm. much we need to worry about it but um you know it's if we can get those things to settle a little bit and get the patient moving comfortably i think we can all agree that that's what it's about is can we now go out in the gym and do a floor to waist lift or a waist to shoulder height lift more comfortably? Then I think there's value in it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the mindfulness piece of it, you know, um, you know, how's this feel? You know, what's the pressure feel like to you? What's the direction of my pressure feeling like? Some of that stuff. I, I think if we use that five minutes purposefully too and not just go, hey, oh, Snoop Dogg, huh? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, sometimes we get caught up in that too and we are trying to build therapeutic alliance but sometimes for me the manual is a better time to understand where the patient's coming from and how they're feeling and i try to yeah. keep them engaged a little bit with the session so yeah <clears throat> and it's not to say there's not a little something going on there and that that we can't help a little bit at some level right mm -hmm. I, I totally get where all pain is going to be perceived in the in the brain uh, but you know, we've talked about no susceptive pain in the past and some, mm -hmm. of that, some of that can be real or there's some level of that that's probably going on. Right? Yeah, I, I would agree as a profession, we probably swung a little too far from no susceptive where we're like, ah, it doesn't matter what's going on exactly. there, even in so a chronic patient, say, but yeah, we don't need to go in, like I said, invest in a bunch of couches and, and just say, okay, the first five sessions, you're going to lay here and we're going to talk, we're going to do nothing but education and because I don't think that's going to, that by itself isn't effective. I don't think any single tool by itself is effective. And that's, that's more of the beauty of what we do and why I think so many studies um, are, you know, unfortunately don't really support any singular uh, mm -hmm. intervention, but right. the more you it's... read them, you go through like journal club, for example, or, you know, you, you thumb through your JOSPT and you just want to kind of like, I don't know, scream at them because you're like, I'm not doing just, you know, mm -hmm. five minutes of PAs and then reassess, you know, then um, assessing their pain and then sending them away. And then six months later, expecting that to like hold up. Yeah, you know, it's always, you know, thing. yeah, these garbage studies, right? Like manual is better, like exercise is better with a little manual. Exercise is better with a little peony. You know, it all comes down to exercise is the best. Yeah, but, but everything but, helps. But not, but never by know. itself, right? It's, it's always a that. little better with something else, you know? Yeah, and, and that, that goes for, like I, I wrote down taping too. Like I'm, I've become a, over time, I've become more and more of a believer in some of the values of like the taping, you know, understanding the purpose, if only for circulation improvement, mm -hmm. you know, and if you, and that's, I've seen that I've bared witness to it with my own eyes when I've had like shifted to, um, you know, a really acute injury that's got a lot of bruising and you tape somebody up and I'm talking like kinesiology taping, right? We use rock tape. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then you go to remove it like three days later and you can see vividly with your own eyes, like, you know, the patterns far different, like where the taping was mm. and the discoloration is vastly improved. So I know it's, it's helping at least improving circulation, which is good for just about everybody um, who's been injured. So I'm a big believer in slapping that on, um, having somebody wear it for a few days as we leave. Again, it's, uh, I, not only do I believe in it, but I think they believe in it, you know, yeah, which is right. equally important. Yeah, I mean, the, the placebo effect isn't always a negative, you know, I think we connotate that with such a negative deal, like you're doing a, a treatment that doesn't work, 
but in, in some ways, no, you've just changed the patient's perception of their environment around them in a positive way. I, I don't think that's bad. Um, and that's like, for me, taping, yeah, I, I've seen it with bruising. You know, if you throw the old octopus over top of them, I mean, you can see everywhere it goes. But the other thing, and I same with the CPAs, is it's mindfulness. If someone's got low back and it's, they're so sensitive to move, and I, I'm no, I'm not a trained uh, rock taper by any means, but if even if I slap a straight line on both sides of erector spinae yep. and send them home, they feel better. Yep. There, there's a little yep. bit of comfort, like I said. There's some mindfulness of like, okay, that's my low back. Like I kind of feel it move because every time I move, the tape stretches and pulls a little bit, and it's okay. You know, again, it's how do you preface it with the patient? I don't go and say, I'm going to put this tape from origin into insertion so I inhibit your muscle activation. Yeah, I, I never um, ever say that. That's, you like, know, mine's I, all about circulation. That's, that's what I'm basically telling them. You know, sometimes a lot of patients come uh, for low back and like, don't you you dare, if you go classic, then don't you dare tape the other way. It's yeah. your facilitator. I would hate to do that. Yeah, they're going to walk in a circle. But, you know, I'll have them take, take their shirt off and they'll have like 14 pieces of tape on their upper back and around their shoulders. And I'm like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, it's, you know, I, I have bad posture. So, like, I have to tape up my upper back so my shoulder and neck don't hurt. It's like, oh, okay, we're going to have, we're going to have some talks and this is going to be maybe more difficult than I thought it was going to be. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that the last part we had there was dry needling. And, uh, you know, I'm also a big believer in that, but as a tool, not as, as the singular, you know, interventional approach, I've seen great results. I've experienced great results of it, mm -hmm. you know, going back to my class, like the classes I took and some of the experience I had afterwards with some chronic, like, um, hip and buttock pain, stuff like that. So, um, but again, it's like how you how you articulate that to your patients is very important too. Like, I don't want to build a reliance on that intervention either, mm -hmm. right? It can't be the only thing that's getting you better or keeping you on your feet, keeping you alive, keeping you moving. It's got, it's just another, another strong tool that we use um, to help get you where you need to be, you know? Yeah, it, we could probably spend a whole hour talking about trigger points and <laughs> our yeah. beliefs and feelings on those. And I think every therapist could probably weigh in on that too. But uh, the one thing I'll say about dry needling is I, I think of all our interventions we have, I think it's the one of the easiest cells to a patient because um, you feel it. I mean, it's very tangible, very tangible. I think it's pretty easy to say, you know, this place is tender, right? It's a abnormal impulse generating site if we don't use trigger point. Um, you know, like it doesn't that. feel like their surrounding area, right? Like mm -hmm. whether you believe it's a muscle that's constantly contracting or what you think is going on there, it it's just feels different. It feels different to the Correct. patient. You put a needle in there, uh, you know, whether you use TENS or you're a flosser and the patient feels it and it feels different. It changes, right? We talk about and again, I don't want to offend a dry needler, but a placebo effect, you've easily changed their perception of their environment with dry needling. I mean, that's quick. Yeah, definitely. I'm not going to argue fast. That. Probably the only other intervention we have comparable is a manipulation. Yeah. You know, um, pretty easy to crack a neck or crack a back and have the patient feel wildly different from before and after. Dry needling is the same thing. This is tender, boom. Now it's sore, but it's not tender anymore, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the feel changes. So the patient buys that pretty quick, that that was a successful intervention. But just like with manipulation, it's trying not to create dependency on it and going every Correct. time you have an Im abnormal impulse generating site and it's painful, that means you need to have dry needling to cure it. You know, I, I think that's the danger. And same with manipulation, right? Your neck feels stiff and tight and we manipped you and it feels better, but it's the manipulation isn't required to feel better. Um, no. We just got you there quick and now you can get moving. And, you know, when your neck gets stiff next time, just get moving, <laughs> you know, do the yeah. stuff we taught you. Um, it, you don't need to come in necessarily and get manipulated. Maybe you do if you just can't handle it on your own, but it's how we preface it. Yeah, I don't disagree there. Not a ton, but I'm, a, <laughs> I'm also a believer in the efficacy of it as well. Uh, but we're, I think we got that down as a topic like in and of itself down the road someday 
as you alluded to, whether it's trigger points, whether it's tri whether it's dry needling singularly, it could could go on and rabbit trail there. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, yeah, we should uh, probably move on to our top five. Yeah. <clears throat> this week's top five uh, with no real rhyme or reason uh, <laughs> how we came across. This just seemed like a fun topic. Um, I wanted to do rom-coms, but you seemed uninterested in that. Did you say rom-coms? Yeah, I, I you... said for Valentine's Day. We, maybe maybe my autocorrect changed it to something weird, but I was like, you, oh, we should do you romantic weird... comedies. <laughs> Your autocorrect the other night was super weird. You got to go back and reread that one. Oh, it just turns out I'm drunk most of the time, so don't worry. I was going to ask if there's a little extra scotch involved. <laughs> in <my life. laughs> no, yeah, I, I'm terrible about like, brrr, send. I don't, I need an editor. I I should, I'll, I'll send it to you later if I get a kick out of it. <laughs> um, I should have just said a smart ass response, but uh, our top five this week top five um, most underrated or forgotten hidden gem songs from the 1980s. Uh, my ending a little nostalgia this morning, uh, going back to the decade that made us. Um, so there's very little criteria here other than the fact that it can't be an artist's like number one biggest hit song. You know, it's got to be something a little deeper cut than that. Um, can still be a hit, but something that maybe has been glossed over a lot. Uh, when you think of the band, you don't always think of the song. When you think of the artist, you don't always think of it. So, hey, is that kind of how you interpret a case? Um, for the most part, yes. Other than like... If it was a band that they only necessarily had one hit and the whole band kind of got forgotten, I, I kind of made a some leeway there to say okay. like, hey, man, this band was really good and they had this one hit and they kind of fall fell off the map. I, I only had, I think, one case of that where I was like, God, this okay. band's so no, good. That's fair. No, that's a good I, this point. Song too. so good, and it was really popular for a period of time, and now you don't hear about it very much, but. When they deep yeah. dive on the radio and it comes on, I'm like, oh man, I can't believe these guys yeah. aren't more. So yeah, for the most part, um, that's kind of what I went with too. You know, mm -hmm. I born in the 80s, uh, can't say I was like a huge 80s music guy. Definitely I'm a more of a 90s guy was when I hit my stride with music. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a fun list to put together because if we were doing the same list with 90s music, I, I probably would have had to spend, I don't know, days and days compiling and I would have yeah. pulled at my heartstrings. I would have had to do a top 30 maybe. So in some ways yeah. it was easier because there was definitely songs that popped in my head right away. And then, you know, you do your research and, you know, you steal other people's lists all the time. That's how I operate. My, um, I might have zero, I'm going to be honest, mine had zero research behind it. So I'm not going to have <laughs> okay. a ton of, like mine was just off my head. I don't know if you can see it. So, oh. okay. so the blue, those are all the ones that I would like just thought of and then i had to reorganize and come up with my top five out of that um and i have in a little bit like i said quite a bit of genre jumping you're gonna pick up on here yeah so. i can't I, I don't know if i did as much i just didn't have a ton of albums from the 80s you know the 80s were weird to me a lot of uh i could say one hit wonders but you know a million different kinds of genres and one or two good songs and it never felt like it justified me buying a whole album yeah um, no, that's fine. That's fine. And I absolutely hate '80s rock music, which is weird. But we're we're not going to get along. Yeah, I can't, cannot stand any sort just, of glam like rock. All, I'm like all. I I think everything has its place at some point. <laughs> uh, well, let's get into it. Yeah, uh, let's I, go. Um, I can go. I I came up with three quick honorable mentions. Um, the first two uh, coming out of the band, coming out of Eagles, we got Don Henley with "End of Innocence." I think it's a great song about like a lot going on fam family wise and Glenn Fry is the one you love very sad sappy yeah. romantic song great yeah. saxophone use phenomenal um and then so that so that's like the Eagles group uh I think one you love was like 82 um same year I was born so that's pretty cool and of innocence a little bit later on in the 80s um but just that I can't listen to Ed of Innocence as a dad now and not think, God, this is being miserable. So good stuff. Um, <laughs> and then we get to uh, 1989's We Die Young by Alice in Chains. Um, mm. Really their, their first uh, hit, as I recall, and their foray into kind of grunge. 
kind of kicking off uh, grunge. They were a little heavier then, mm-hmm. but um, but uh, yeah, that's those are my honorable mentions. Um, we Die Young, Alice in Chains, probably closest I got to six. Number five, uh, getting into the real deal now, um, where it matters. Where's My Mind by Pixies. Uh-huh, okay. I, this was fresh from our talk yeah, a couple weeks ago. Talk. We closed the Fight Club um, off of 1988 Serpa Rosa. I remember my brother had that album, and I just thought, if you've seen the cover, you were immediately drawn to it as a young man. <laughs> um, and then the song is so, like, it's just, it's like everybody could go how deep stuff is, you know. But Pixies were also kind of like a precursor to a lot of, I, I remember in the 90s, a lot of people were reference, they were like name drop all the time because they'd already been broken up. And it was like cool to reference them, but mm. way ahead of their time, um, way ahead of the curve on a little bit of that grunge all rock shift that came later. Yeah, this song definitely was uh, one of my like first things that popped into my mind. And I guess I just battled with like how forgotten it was. Um, just with our recent Fight Club talk, I, you know, I was like, oh man, I got a kind of a resurgence there. And, um, Mm-hmm. so didn't quite make my list so you're Great saying it's song. too it's you're saying it's too big and too popular to be on your list yeah got it. wait till you hear my got list it. I'm um, got it. <laughs> yeah. so for me i had a few honorable mentions too uh they were honorable mentions because again i wasn't quite sure where they would sit on popularity, where, where people would feel about them. Like I felt like they were lesser known. Uh, my first one was 1983. These are honorable mentions. Bananarama, na na, hey, hey, kiss them goodbye. Um, mm-hmm. Cool song. And, and I thought like everybody knows that song, but they know like those three words, right? Like uh-huh. <laughs> the song <laughs> itself. And that song's a cover from a really old song. So it, it kind of didn't hit enough of my criteria um next one would have been 1989 uh nirvana negative creep from bleach Mm, yeah Uh, same thing like nirvana's so heavy yeah so heavy a little different than everything else from nirvana um but that being said nirvana's catalog so limited that i was like well everybody's kind of heard it knows it because they've had it's become it's become a little bit more of a you know prominent yeah kind of like what you said with with where's my mind yep and then the last one was uh 1987 uh this album was killer so it was uh guns and roses mr brownstone again the album's so popular that i was like can i even pick something from there but you know i agree like the fifth cut from that album and i think it's one of my favorite songs on that album just it's so it's so like nonchalant like yeah we're rock stars uh we do heroin all the time i can barely get out of bed like it's just kind of this cool it's, it's rock great. star yeah. uh, view of their life. And I love the song. You're I think right. the guitars are cool, but that album's just so popular. I was like, can I pick a song from there? If I was going to go off of that album, I'd take Rocket Queen. You mm-hmm. know, and <clears throat> it's so, but the whole, you're right, the whole album is like iconic. So. Yeah, so that, that's kind of why they made honorable mention. They didn't quite hit all my criteria, so... My first one, uh, my number five, 1986, uh, from a, I don't know how well known this band is in a lot of ways. I think people know the music, um, but Oingo Boingo, Dead Man's Party, um, yep. probably their Danny sec- Elfman. Danny Elfman, uh, correct. So right before Dead Man's Party would have came out, right at the time he started doing movie soundtracks, kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, this was actually in the movie Back to School. Um, they yep. perform it live. They perform. Um, yeah. Uh, but just kind of, it's a cool band. They were ska punk. Uh, Danny Elfman, I think he's a cool vocalist. He, he's yeah. he's able to scream, sing pretty well in that ska style. Mm-hmm. Um, the song is dark, you know, it's kind of yeah, about it, yeah. being dead, right? But they play it super upbeat. Um so yeah, I think it's just a cool song. You know, it's uh, right up there with Weird Science, another Wingo Boy <laughs> song. You know, just they have cool music, and you you could tell he was gonna do soundtracks. That was his thing. I mean, his music was just it fit that so well. Very, this was this was just a preview into who he is now. I mean, just the ultimate soundtrack guy. So, you, well, definitely for Tim Burton, right? I yeah, mean, those everything. two have collaborated for like ever, and he's done a lot of other stuff. He's he's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's. I awesome. love great great choice casey i love that little sidebar every so we lost my dad seven years ago and um on january 8th and 
every year where I can, I watch Back to School because that was like <laughs> from his all time favorite movie. <laughs> okay. So I almost put Jude Cole's song Back to School on here. Because <laughs> okay. I, but I, I don't even know if that was ever really a hit. But, yeah, I don't know if I would call that a hit. But it's got a soft spot in my heart. Uh, awesome choice. All right, number four, four. Only the Young by Journey. Mm. Journey as a band, obviously, tons and tons of hits. Steve Perry, some people might call him the best vocalist in all of rock. I've seen that distinction laid upon yeah. him. Nobody on this podcast, but go on. <laughs> but uh, so I re- <laughs> referenced Vision Quest last week. It's actually a movie that opened, there's a song that opens the movie up while Loud and Swain's out cutting weight thing um, in his in a sauna suit. Um, great, great kind of up tempo riff by them. I think it's quite a bit underrated compared to, you know, like obviously Don't Stop Believing. Um, you hear, you know, the songs you hear constantly on classic rock now, um, faithfully, you know, you'll hear that one a lot, open arms still. But I don't, I think only the young is, is probably my favorite song there is the one that's most re-listenable in my mind so that's my number four by journey um, only the young yeah i don't have a lot of comment on there i'm not a huge journey fan. i think they should all be forgotten gems i think you should d- dig deep <laughs> go back <laughs> and re-explore <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe i just haven't given them a fair enough shake uh bar karaoke and bar jukebox is a ruined journey for me completely I don't disagree there <laughs> we were out at, at my brother's bachelor party and and uh there's a big karaoke bar out there that we hit up and and it's like you're always going to hear somebody gets up and does not don't stop leaving, you know some rendition of that and you're like come on yeah and the whole but, crowd gets into it like it's this just perfect song and i ugh. You know, I blame Glee, the show Glee for that, because I think it totally just drilled it into everybody's consciousness again and, and yeah. since that time. But they have a ton of other stuff worth checking <laughs> out, right, my man. All right. I'll, uh, um, I'll take your word for it. We'll just go uh, our separate I got to watch Vision Quest first. That's, yes, that's above my list uh, instead of watching Journey. My number 444, 1985. St. Elmo's Fire, Man in Motion, John Parr. Uh, this song is a banger. Uh, you know, huge song when it came out. Huge song. <laughs> That's why I don't think, I don't know if I can call this When's the last but, time you heard this song on the radio? Uh, like probably like Monday. <laughs> I don't believe that one second. Yeah. I've never heard this song on the radio well, in I'm pretty sure our, 15 our, years. Our, our classic station down here, I'm pretty sure it's just like, some amalgam of I heart 70s and I heart 80s radio. So yeah. Go uh, on though. Maybe John it's Park just, uh, yeah, right. It's a uh, uplifting song, right? It's uh that chorus hits hard. He uh yeah. oh man, he <laughs> that that classic 80s uh, again. I hate it, but that but hair you hate metal-y, journey. Yeah. that hair metal like growls, screams, saying almost fire when he belts that out in the chorus. Uh, yeah it's so good um for a style of music i hate and you know the song is not (laughs) about the movie you know he wrote it about uh well i believe it was what's that yeah guy in a wheelchair that was going across the country um you know man and man in motion or whatever um tour it was called um so you know it's just about you know looking to the future and you know being motivated to keep driving yourself and to keep going to be better yeah. you know the movie was a, a terrible rat pack movie but uh the song was good yeah I can't you're just movie. you're just sour on this decade not a little i'm a little okay <laughs> but like I, I would i think that's like other than <laughs> other than like breakfast club that's that's like the best rat pack movie in my opinion. i know oh, i would Mm. <laughs> there's some things that are weird that don't yeah, age that's... well like what like Emilio basically stalking Andy McDowell's doctor character yeah, know, and then he still plants one on her at the end it's like yeah it's no like, it's a on. bad movie <laughs> but uh, it's I mean, like a awesome second movie. rate breakfast club it's like oh let's make everybody kind depressed of. by seeing what these people are like when they're a little older it's so like... that should be right up your alley you like that dark edge <laughs> oh wait till you get the rest of my list you know, right, Rob, Rob Lowe 
<laughs> Give me, come on. We got a Rousey. Right, we got to We're up against time. Like, we're, we'll keep it moving on. All right. My number three is uh, from 1983 is Flight of Icarus by Iron Maiden. Uh, mm. I think Iron Maiden's known for a lot of other songs. Uh, for some reason, I'm such a nerd on kind of classical mythology. <laughs> you know, I just love the fact <laughs> that a metal band wrote a whole song about Icarus. That's and, big with uh, metal bands. Didelius, yeah. you, know? you, had to, you had to paint it on the side of your van or you weren't metal. Some sort of yeah. <laughs> Pegasus, Icarus, dragon thing. Yeah. Don't fly too close to the sun. The wing, you know, the glue shall melt and he falls to the earth. And, but but even aside from that, I, I legitimately feel like the song has some good clout, good musicianship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and um, I, I was talking with his patient on Monday about this, but I don't think there was ever as good of a level of up with a band as when Iron Maiden brought in Bruce Dickinson to take over lead vocals. I, I think um, I think it just made a huge difference. So that's my number three, Flight of Icarus, Iron Maiden. Don't hate it. Good call. Good band, good song. Uh, mine is hey, thank you. Yeah, that was way better than your other choices. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my next song is from 1986, uh, a band from I believe Australia, New Zealand, Crowded House. Don't dream it's over. Um, just a what's classic that? case, somber classic case. Yeah, I know it's somber, but at the same time, it's. A little bit of a, I don't know, slacker, hippie anthem in the 80s, probably after its time, which I don't know, was probably why it doesn't hold up as well. But, uh, you know, hey now, hey now, like it's just a good beat. Yeah. That's where we're doing a podcast and not like actually cutting records. <laughs> <laughs> Get in the studio. So no, I think that's a, it's a great song and uh, you never, I don't hear it much anymore. It's been covered a few times by people, but not to uh, the extent and popularity that was then. I, I think it was uh, close to a top 40 hit in that time, but just kind of yeah. fell out and I think it still holds up. It's a good song. Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Uh, moving on to my number two, I have uh, Bruce Hornsby and the range with the song Mandolin Rain. Uh, more of a kind of a somber ballad. I'm a pian I like the piano usage. Bruce Hornsby was incredibly talented with piano. And he's obviously the best known for the way it is. And then later on getting that covered by Tupac posthumously, which mm. created another second life for it. Um, but Mandolin Rain was a song that I <clears throat> like one of those things that I the song that um, didn't really know I liked. And then a couple years ago um, it came up on like a YouTube feed one night when Michelle and I were just watching old music videos and and I'm like, I love this song. I forget how much I really enjoyed it, you know. And and since then, it's been, you know, kind of in my uh, my playlist. So, Mandolin Rain, I think it's from '86, '85 or '86 by Bruce Hornsby and the Range. Yeah, I can't say I'm familiar uh, familiar with the Tupac uh, sampling. <laughs> that's well, that's a different song, case. Okay? Yeah, and so. that's why this is hidden gems or oh. forgotten gems. Okay, uh, my number two is maybe going to be controversial based on. Uh, popularity because uh, you're gonna go with like beat it by michael jackson yeah, or something. Right. you never hear it anymore <laughs> <laughs> um i it's not that bad but it, it's definitely i would say the most famous song from this band um a band that's still around but really mm -hmm. has never had another radio hit uh, that's been anywhere near this popular but this the song itself the album itself was pretty influential uh for the kind of music i listened to in the 90s uh big big precursor to the new new metal style of music um, new metal yeah huge influence on corn uh, deftones those kind of bands so it was 1989 faith no more with epic um probably one of the tastiest bass licks uh, of any sort of rock music at the time you know the band got kind of pushed out because of the amount of funk and rap they had um which yeah. it then five, six years later became the prevailing style of music. But this song, every time I hear it on the radio, which isn't too much, but you hear that bass line come yeah. in and it's downturn guitars, downtuned bass. And I don't, it, it's an awesome yeah. song and it's doesn't get probably the respect it deserves when you talk about music for Ooh. the average person. I think you ask musicians, it comes up quite a bit, but the average person probably isn't overtly familiar with it. Casey, you, you just did a number two and you uh, you blew up my brain, bro, because 
I, as soon as you mentioned Faith No More, my mind is like, how did I not have, I wouldn't have gone with Epic. I would have gone with um, probably, oh, what's the other, the, the second hit that they had on there, back and forth, I swear with the win, you know? Um, yeah, let me, uh, I went back and forth as well on which song I should pick because their right. their first single off that album was nowhere near as popular um but it was um from out of nowhere no yeah from out of nowhere yeah um, that's was, not just way up tempo very different sound, very different i know. didn't feel like it was influential as epic which isn't what this list is about but at the same yeah. time i was like hey, i don't know epic's real, not known enough where i think the album's a real thing right it's yep. the real thing yep. and the yep. song the real thing is amazing too like the, the title album. track <laughs> it's a great album very um, underrated album yeah uh, holy cow and i think by the time they released to your point when they released angel dust i think it's hard to sell an album at the time very hard to sell an album called angel dust and market it you know <laughs> yeah, yeah it and, wasn't and if you popular listen to it in the time it's a really cool album but it's i get where it's not as accessible as anything else that was coming out at the time yeah it was you know it was this weird time because it was them and uh the chili peppers trying to do this infusion yeah. type music and neither, of them had, neither of them yeah. Yeah, hated each other um because they i think they felt like they were encroaching on each other's territory yeah. and, Patton and Patton and uh Kiedis both yep. thought yeah yeah and, and they were both probably right you know for, but they should have just like i don't know joined forces yeah for whatever awesome reason event. the chili peppers figured the formula out a little better than faith no more did and faith no more disappeared and they're back right i think i think they just I came read, out with an album through my super research. heavy i think yeah, <laughs> yeah. i haven't um, had time to listen to it but i like literally this year they just came out actually, with one i'm like I, st- I streamed it um <laughs> like a couple that saw it it's like really heavy really heavy stuff and, um, very different sound like where the chili peppers have continued to evolve in a different direction altogether mm. and they're also they just dropped a song last week so um pretty neat well, moving on, we should probably wrap things yep. up. Uh, number one, um, the band is Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> They've had ton, and that's really where this origin. Now I'm thinking about it. that's where this all started. Um, so they've had tons and tons of hits, or they did. Um, Walking on a Thin Line is my number one. Um, from when I was like a little kid, always really enjoyed it. Still like it to this day. Great synth riff to open it up, and and. Um, from a Huey Lewis in the news, it's like one of them is not tongue in cheek. It's just more of a straightforward song yeah. where they're not playing it up. But it's kind of like everything's like a joke or a, mm. you know a, you know a cynical like arm, which isn't all bad either. But, uh, yeah, that's my number one. They've had they had just a wealth of hits. I think it's on sports, which is probably their best album in my opinion. But they continue to have a bunch of uh, hits after that. But this one gets forgotten about quite often. I think. Yeah, I uh, want a new drug was kind of on my short list, but again, I didn't know if it was too popular. Um, but again, at the time, it was super popular. I don't know if I hear it a lot anymore. I think um, as long as you don't go, Huey Lewis in the news isn't necessarily that played that much. Again, I don't know what you guys are listening to down there on the seventies and eighties hit stations. You gotta have but... you gotta have something safe for patients. Seventies <laughs> and eighties does it. Yeah, and they get into nineties too. Okay, my last one from 1987, uh, Gerard McMahon, Cry Little Sister. I is that, that who's is this from? Is this uh, from the Lost, Lost Boys? Boys soundtrack? That's um, who sings it. Most people have no idea who sings it. Most people <laughs> probably do, have never like sat down and listened to the song. Um, I think the song's a banger. It's got it's got like a little Ozzy Osbourne type feel to it. Yep. It's um, huge vocals. It's creepy. It's it's a song yep. that I think would be popular today with some of the rock dark music crowd. I mean, well, I think, it, I think Manson, Manson covered, covered it. Covered yep. it. Yep. Not not too long ago, and I think his cover probably didn't take much traction either, if I remember correctly. But <clears throat> um, I should have went with Tim Capello from lost boys doing the i still believe the sax the jack saxophone guy because he's known yeah. yeah there's a few bangers on that soundtrack <laughs> but yeah i yeah. just that song man i was young when that movie came out and we i watched that with my brother a million times and every time that comes on in the background just jam out and then i actually started listening to the song itself and it's even better yeah like, good song good choice yeah good choice. it used that to be means- on the radio all the time i never hear it on the radio 
that was one of those movies that for like three or four years in a row, every time I'd have like a birthday party, we'd, we'd rent, you know, Peru, rent the VHS tapes. <laughs> and uh, after tearing around the farm, we'd like, you know, try to hammer out these awesome eighties movies and lost oh, boys was like three or four years in a row. We just watched that. And, like that tremors that's a whole nother list we got to come up with <laughs> yeah that's the problem with this town too many damn vampires michelle and i have an ongoing <laughs> debate over that movie because for some reason she came into it way late she did not experience it um at the time we would have and she hates it you know <laughs> oh, and and we Corey have feldman these... Corey him he can't get I, better jason that's patrick 80s. yeah it's key for some i mean the crew alex winter from oh, yeah. Bill and Ted's Bill and Excellent Ted. Adventure is one of the vampires. I mean, just a fantastic, fun, dumb, awesome movie. So yeah. sometimes you just gotta go with song. it. Yeah, great song. Right after I think that comes on, right? It's 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 incorporated in the film right after uh Jason Patrick gets turned, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, I believe that's when uh yeah, and it's the classic 80s slow montage <laughs> <I> feel, yeah. <laughs> get emotional yeah. back yeah. when movies had to tell you how to feel yeah nothing wrong with that <laughs> no. steer your steer your frame of thought you yeah. know and all that but good list man i'm i'm not gonna knock your list i mean you like to knock the heck out of my list but you know, no, i'm very cynical yours. yeah well you know i had I mean, some other i, I hey, gotta I, be i i would need to dive into your list because i don't know how popular any of those songs were to begin with so mine (laughs) they i think every one of them well we'll just save that discussion (laughs) time all top 40 hits pretty close all right all right you know flight of icarus would be the one that honestly was never probably released on radio (laughs) until like until you got like till serious xm came into the picture and then you started picking up on stuff like an aussie's bully or things like stations like that so no i i don't want to sit here and be a hater on your list it was a good list you do good work Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, another good week in the books. Suppose better go be a better yeah. go be fathers, dads, be, be dads, then be therapists, yeah. and uh go from there. Yeah. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh obviously, if you like us, subscribe to us. We now have some videos up on our YouTube channel as well with PT Shop Talk. Um, not in order because I'm terrible about doing things organized, but our last <laughs> three episodes are up. Um So if you want to see what our mugs look like, uh, see how animated we get, go ahead and check that out as well. Until next time, see you, everybody. See you, guys.